a global food shortage, a crashed oil market, and rampant mistrust. What is going on with the coronavirus this week? Stay tuned to find out. So about a month ago, the United States was looking at about 400 deaths from the coronavirus. Now here we are less than a month later and we're looking at 45 to 50,000. Today there's going to be just a short briefing about what's going on and my take on it and also how the coronavirus has changed me forever which will segue into what this channel was created to be about and that's doing more with less. And in this coming economy, you're going to need to know how to do more with less. Okay. Where to start? First, please click the subscribe button and the bell notification so that you won't miss anything. And please be sure to check out my books, free for Kindle Unlimited on Amazon. Thank you. So here we are with a tenfold increase in coronavirus deaths. Our country here in the United States, but it's pretty much the same everywhere, has been closed down for several weeks. And this does seem to have made a big difference, this mitigation effort of keeping the numbers down and the spread down. Um, we, we can't really say it's flattened the curve because if you look, if you go to uh, the site I like is Worldometer Corona, um, the curve is basically a straight up and down line. So there's no flattening going on right now. But places like New York, which have been absolutely hit terribly hard, are starting to see a decrease in their cases. And the hospitals didn't did get overwhelmed, but did not need all those extra hospitals and those hospital ships that came in. So uh, maybe we overshot it a little bit, but who knows? I mean, there's no way to actually predict what's going to happen. Originally, models were telling us that we were going to have 2 million deaths if we did nothing. And then they were saying 200,000, and then they were saying 60,000. Well, uh, I never didn't think the 60,000 was a little bit low, and uh, it's getting clear that it's a lot a bit low because we already in the United States have 45 to 50,000. I haven't even checked today, so somewhere between 45 and 50,000 deaths. And this thing, this virus, this beast, is supposed to last at least a year and a half until we have a vaccine. So if we have that in just a matter of a month, um, what are we going to be looking at in six months? And so here we are opening the country back up and there's so much controversy and the Republicans think one thing, the Democrats think another thing. And, and even within those groups, there's all kinds of conspiracy theories about people lying about numbers and all the way up to the, to the president of not believing China was putting out real numbers. And I don't... <sighs> Not too many people believe that things were as transparent as they could have been. China has recently doubled their numbers, which is still a very, very low number of deaths and uh, is, is difficult to believe that that is indeed true. Uh, there's also all kinds of controversies about millions of uh, Chinese cell phones that were closed down and the Chinese use their cell phones to pay for things and as identification so they don't generally get closed down unless they die so and then these long lines of people picking up urns so it just a lot of things are not adding up and making sense and just logically you can look at the numbers of countries that where they have so many cases and you can expect so many deaths and there but it doesn't it, it looks suspect uh, so there's this back and forth as we all know but he believes that the virus started in Wuhan near some wet market or in the wet market oh the United States uh, was suggesting this and then the Chinese Communist Party was saying that an American military brought it there and so to counteract that narrative uh, the the White House was then calling it the China virus which uh, people were saying was prejudice. So anyway, that's all that in a nutshell. But here we are getting ready to reopen our country. And the reason why we're reopening our country is because it's becoming very clear that people need to work. I mean, you can close down and you can agree with that or disagree with it, but I think we can all agree that people need to work. And a $1,200 stimulus, which is what the American government gave most Americans as a one-time payment, well, uh, that doesn't do a whole lot. That might cover your mortgage for one month, but that doesn't cover all your other bills. That doesn't cover food and all this, uh, you know, your utilities and your car payment and all this other stuff. So there's a couple of bills going through Congress and one is 
uh, is suggesting to give every American over the age of 16 $2,000 uh, per month. And, and I'm not sure for how long, two months, three months, four months, I don't know. Uh, the other bill is suspending mortgages and rent for a year, and we'll see what happens. We are also looking at, for the first time in history, this crazy crashing of the oil market. And so the story is that uh, people weren't going anywhere, uh, companies were shut down. So just oil was not being needed the same way. And that's com completely understandable. People aren't traveling or many people aren't even working. So uh, apparently the Saudis and the Russians were talking about it and uh, things did not go well and they got into this price war deal and now they're basically, it's changing faster than I can keep up with, but the last I looked they were actually negative like $40 a barrel or something like that. So it was just crazy because they had to where put the oil and nobody wanted the oil. So um, that's different, but here we are of financial deficits in this company and, and it employs so many people. It's such a big sector and an important sector that the government's going to have to most likely bail it out and that we could be looking at billions or tr even trillions of dollars, which is we were, we're already in what we call infinity quantitative easing, which is in a nutshell, we're just printing in the United States, we're just printing money and we're not the only one. So that's sort of the um, saving grace is that pretty much everybody's doing this now um, to help their citizens are just printing money. Problem with that is that you print too much. And so say we give every American $2,000 and we bail out airlines and we bail out the cruise ship and we bail out the oil industry, et cetera, et cetera. Suddenly we've printed too much money and it can result in deflation and hyperinflation. And I would say if you're interested in all the economic fallout of this, and I'm very interested because it affects us all so very much, uh, one of the things uh, that you can study is how it went with the Great Depression and read books from the Great Depression that talk about this. And I, I've read a couple and it's absolutely fascinating because if you didn't know you were reading a book from the Great Depression and some of these are like diary type things, you would swear you were reading the news, the front page news from today. And history has a way of repeating itself. So following how it went down in the Great Depression may give you a little bit of foresight in how it might go down again. And I believe that we're looking at not a greater recession, but possibly a greater depression. So, and I am preparing accordingly. Coronavirus has changed me completely, utterly at my core forever. And I'm sure that you all have your own story. So, I, and I would love to hear how the coronavirus has changed you. If you wouldn't mind, put that in the comments below. I love to read it and uh, to commiserate with you. The other thing there's, we're looking at global for food shortages, potentially. So here's the deal. Russia has stopped sending grains out. They might need it for their people. India has stopped sending medicine out. They might need it for their people. So we're looking at food shortages. We're looking at medicine shortages. There are places in Asia that are no longer exporting rice for the same reasons. And uh, now in the United States, a bunch of food plants have like more workers than not are sick with the coronavirus that so the plants are being shut down. And so we're being warned that there's going to be a food shortage or a, a meat, particularly a meat shortage. And they think it'll be short term. The animals aren't aren't scarce. It's the processing. So if you have a local butcher that processes their own meat or allows you to, so that might be a really good option. It might be a good option to um, get a rice and beans cookbook and learn to make some vegetarian cuisine. So I'm going to trust myself. So, you know, I told you I have started a garden. I ha always had a garden, a uh, vegetable garden, but now mine's like, you know, tenfold what it was. And I'm just in the suburbs, so it's not gonna be too huge, but I'm, hoping to build up to where I have enough produce for my family, you know, through the winter time. So I'm building up to that and, and, you know, learning to reseed and learning to ferment and learning to can things like that. I really want to be self-sufficient. And so that's one of the ways that this coronavirus has changed me before this whole pandemic. I was sort of at this crossroads. I became an empty nester. So, but I was really just feeling kind of trapped by life and where I was and in my home and was thinking, man, it'd be so nice to just sell everything and move off to Key West and just, you know, be a hippie. And then this virus came and I realized I would have been absolutely miserable and scared to death if I was just out in Hippieville, you know, doing my own thing and not really having a, a, a grounding anywhere. And so 
uh, suddenly I have a new appreciation for my home and for being self-sufficient. I really am like truly enjoying and loving being able to grow things and teach other people how to do it. And I'm thinking about raising quail and, and I'm learning to make sauerkraut and, uh, you know, I just ground up my own horseradish, <laughs> um, sauce and I'm growing horseradish, so all these things. And it's really fulfilling. And I think it's how God created me. Uh, I, you know, back, going back to the Garden of Eden. So, um, I, and also I'm doing some soul searching of, I don't want to just help myself. I want to help other people. And that's very fulfilling to me. So um, I'm looking ahead at this economic crisis. I'm trying to hold on to my job and, uh, and you can't help but be worried if, if everybody in the country is out of a job at the same time is out of food, we run out of food, things could get really ugly and really scary. And then you, you escalate it to a global level. I mean, things could get bad really quickly and we, none of us know how it's going to go. We really don't, you know, we can speculate and I can do a lot of speculating. I'm on the Myers-Briggs scale at INFJ and our superpower is sort of following things through to their logical conclusion, but there's never just one logical conclusion, right? There's always possibilities and like the toilet paper, <laughs> the toilet paper, the great toilet paper uh, mystery of this whole coronavirus. I didn't see that coming. I didn't predict that. I've gotten a lot of things right, but that, you know, that came out of left field. So, uh, so here we go. So that's how it's changed me and this channel is uh, doing more with less. And so I hope that you'll stick around even past all the health information that I've been sharing with you and learn how we're going to learn how to uh, be self-sufficient. We're going to learn how to save money. We're going to learn how to get back to basics and, and what this channel's tagline is, is do more with less. And that's really uh, what I aim to do. And a lot of it I'll be learning along with you. And I hope that um, I hope that you'll stick around. I hope that you'll subscribe and I hope that you can share what you know and we can just learn from each other. So thanks for watching. Stay healthy.